Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the greatest musicians and bands in the world. And we've got one for you today. The Blue Tones are guaranteed to bring hits to any radio show. And I'm delighted to say that Mark Morris joins us on the phone now. How you doing, Mark? Very well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm really delicious, but not as good as you. I imagine your life is perfect. You're a rock star, you've got great hits, and you're back on the road. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my life is absolutely perfect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, I'm in a, I'm in a good, I'm in a good moment right now, which is what I would say if I was a um, international football manager. I'm in a very good moment. Looking forward to rehearsing, which we haven't started yet. I know the tour starts in eight days, but we start rehearsing in a couple. Let's go back to the 90s. I mean, it was such a perfect time for music. You were part of that sort of Chris Evans, Radio 1 hit list with Oasis and Blur. How much fun was it to be part of something that big? Your timing was impeccable, wasn't it? I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a particularly fruitful period for, for, for guitar music, for guitar pop. And, um, yeah, we were found ourselves... Um, kind of being swept away with that whole wave of um, enthusiasm. For me, Slight Return is probably one of the greatest radio records of all time. Tell me how you go about thinking of that and how that comes together. Talk me through your process. Well, it's, these things, well, certainly for us, they seem to happen by chance. I guess we've just got quite a good collective ear. But that was one of the very first songs that we even wrote together. So to talk about, talk about peaking too soon... I mean, did you know when you were writing it that you'd got a hit? <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, um, a couple of us in the band had to be really convinced that it was the right thing to do to release it as a single because um, we, weren't, we weren't so sure ourselves. I think sometimes you're a bit too close to see, aren't you, outside? Sometimes it's only outside opinion or an outside pair of ears that can help you have a little bit, you know, a little bit of distance. The stars aligned, you know, we had that song in our pocket. It was what the... Um, the collective consciousness required and you know we were just make many vessels for it to get the dynamic right between the group between you adam scott and of course uh, eds how do you make sure that that's balanced because if one person becomes resentful that's when sort of bands seem to get into trouble how did you balance that i think you keep an eye out for each other i think as, as friends you kind of keep an eye out and you sort of make sure everyone's okay make sure everyone's feeling happy just in the way that you just do, um, you know, like a family, you look after each other. We certainly did. We've always been really close friends, and and right, right from the early days up till now, you know, that bond has been very, very strong between us. We like each other, we respect each other, and we've always been able to maintain a healthy sense of perspective about what it is that we do and uh, what it is that we have. And, you know, we, we, we're, we're lucky. We, we, we cherish this thing. It's like... um. You know, it's like, um, it's like Mick, you know, Mick, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. If you think, you know, you, you hear all these stories about how they don't get on and yeah. how they don't really like each other. But when you, when you hear them speak of each other, there's this mutual respect because they know that they need each other. Right. And it's the same with us. You know, it stops you falling out because you, you need one another. You've got something that they need. They've got something that you need. Right. And therefore, you work it out. Is the tour bus the best place on earth and also the worst? Because there's no getting away from these friends. And if you're getting on each other's tits, it's only going to end in disaster. Is that the best and worst bit of being in a band? No, I think it's, I think, I think actually not, not so much the tour bus as the studio. I mean, the, the recording studio can be quite an, not, not, intimidating is not the right word, but it's a bit of a pressure cooker. And when, you know, and when you're in there working, creating something, that can be, difficult sometimes if you're not saying seeing eye to eye because on a tour bus you can just go for a you know you can go for a, go for a walk sit at the other end of the bus have a lie down have a cup of tea and in, in that sense when you're on tour it doesn't it feels more like play you know it doesn't right. feel like you're kind of cutting loose this is what it's all about and every day you're getting this immediate reward which is a, a crowd's reaction to your music but in the studio sometimes I think that seclusion and that sense of being cut off can magnify problems so I'd say the tour bus is easy yeah. compared to certain other environments 
Let's start in the studio because without the great songs, you're not going to have hits and therefore you're not going to tour. How do you know when a song is finished? Because this is the question that baffles me about musicians. How do you know when to stop and when the, the song is ready? Because that must be the ultimate judgment uh, that if you get wrong, it's going to ruin the record. It's just difficult to say, really. It's difficult to say. I mean, you just know. It's difficult to, know, to say how you've managed to come to that end. But you just know. It's like... You know, it's like a recipe. You have ideas for a song, and you have ideas. That you, you, you know, you write everything down on on these big, big notice boards. Let's try this. Let's try this. Because you know, I can hear this in my head. I can hear this. And then you try it, and when, and when it's out of your head and it's in the real world, sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes it takes you by surprise. I guess you just there's just a sense of okay, everything I wanted to say has been said, and everyone feels the same. You've had 13 top 40 singles, uh, three top 10 albums, which means you did all the biggest shows, you did all the greatest uh, magazines and newspapers and met all the biggest stars. What was the moment when you realised, I think we're on our way to making it? Was there a seminal moment or did it just all blend into one? I, I, think, it all, I, I think it's difficult to put it down to just one moment, yes. There was just a, a, a feeling... Um, at the time, we were getting busier and busier and busier and being asked to appear on television shows and that sort of thing. And I think when you cross over into the world of television, um, at, for the first time, there is a sense then of like, oh, hang on a minute, this could, be, uh, this could be serious. I think that's the thing that hits home. I think as a, as a child, your strongest, my strongest musical memory is all through the television. So there is a sense of like, okay, you're joining this slightly bigger elite did you ever go nuts? Was there a point where it became too much? Because that's the thing that always fascinates me about groups like yours, the hedonism of it, the popularity of it, and whether you can keep your feet on the floor. Are there moments you have to pinch yourself and say, hang on, you're being a bit of an arse now, calm down, you're just a normal guy who has to go to the bathroom at the end of the day? Oh, yeah, but I think that, yeah, of course. But, I mean, uh, for me, that's always tied up with just being a young man anyway. Right. I think you've got to kind of have a word for yourself constantly as a, as a young person anyway. You know, the, the universe does seem to uh, revolve around you for those first few years of young manhood. And if you give um, some success, you put some success into that into that formula as well, and it can be quite tricky. But, no, I mean, I think it wasn't, we weren't particularly hedonistic or particularly debauched, but being 23, 24 years old and having a number one record and... Yes, I think it's healthy for you to let off some steam and to enjoy it. I think the danger comes when you're unable to press the off button. And I wonder what it's like being attractive and a sex symbol. I am a deeply unattractive man, Mark, and I've never had this feeling. What is it like to stand on stage and have women throwing themselves at you? It's the greatest. Mm. It's not just on stage. I get it in the supermarket, in the post office, Good Lord. the petrol station. This it's, is remarkable. It's a gift and a curse. <sighs> what a life. I mean, if I could just have just 1% of it that you've got, do you know what I mean? It must be a, a fabulous feeling. It's not too late. Surgery, what do you recommend? I just learn a guitar. That seems to increase your attractiveness by about a thousand percent. Do you know what? You joke, but it's true, isn't it? Girls do like that. I mean, you know, if you play the violin as a fella, you're not going to get the same reaction as playing a guitar. I, I don't know, you know. I don't know. I just think there's something about... Uh, somebody can play an instrument and play it well. I mean, I don't think it's just. I don't think it's exclusive to girls. Mm. I've always had a soft spot for cellists. <laughs> <laughs> I, cellist. I don't know what it is. It's something very sensual and very. Uh, what are you, it's very intriguing, isn't it? Someone who's mm. who's in touch with that that side of themselves. Yes, I'm the same with the flugel horn. I find that <laughs> mildly erotic, to be honest. <laughs> And then, of course, you decided to end the group in 2011 and you worked on your solo stuff. Was that brave? Was that stupid? Or was that actually the great move to walk away to then be able to come back today? Well, I think it's just what we all needed to do in 2011. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to stress it wasn't me that said, that's it. And I didn't do, do it because I wanted to become a solo artist. I was sort of flung into being a solo artist as a yeah. result of the end of the band. But... Yes, I think it was definitely the right thing for us to do. We enjoyed, uh, we enjoyed everything that had happened to the band for a number of years, and then we had a couple of years where things were a bit more difficult for us, and 
Um, this is behind the scenes. I think we've had bad experiences with management and accountants and that sort of thing. And uh, there just comes a point where you're, you feel like you're fighting fires the whole time. Yeah. And I think we just needed to step away from that. Do you think the business is even more complicated now? It's changed so much. It seems like it's more of a production. There's more people involved. When I want to get to you, I've got to go through 35 different people. Yeah. It is complicated, isn't it, to be in the game? Oh, well, yeah. It's an industry that creates little industries within itself. I, sometimes it feels to me like there's just um, there are just many things there to keep the artist away from their audience, their music, and the people that they need to work with. I, you know, there's, it's, it's an industry of opinions. Yeah. Everyone's, everyone's popping up with good advice on, you know, good career path to take. But yeah, it certainly is a complicated industry, and I, I, an overcomplicated industry. It does amaze me how I sit in boardrooms watching 22-year-olds telling 40-year-olds how to do their job. It is remarkable how it swings around this business. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's not always such a bad thing, but yeah, I, I do I do take your point. Um, sometimes I need to be told what to do by some young whippersnapper, and sometimes I don't. Uh, it's just I guess it depends on the advice, doesn't it? Yeah. But, I mean this always this industry's always been like, and it's more complicated now than ever. What with all the different platforms for music and all the and, and the, for the nature of licensing and how complicated it's got now that we've got things like Spotify and iTunes and where the money's going who's getting it and there's just there's just more and more people wanting to take money out of the artist's pocket these yeah. days so you've got to watch yourself the other thing I, I've always wondered about this new media as they call it is how do you really know who's earning what where and when because it's all on trust really isn't it I mean yes. if it's almost impossible to know whether you've had a million hits on YouTube or a thousand because YouTube tell you whether you've had a million or a thousand. Yeah, exactly. I know it doesn't. It seems to be quite self-governing at the moment, doesn't it? And uh, which isn't help, which isn't very helpful. Makes it all the more impenetrable for people, you know, people like me who want to know how they, you know, how their work is being received. Yeah. You just got to take the word for it. I mean, I think Spotify is the main problem at the moment uh, with the. Um, with the equal distribution of funds. The guy that's selling one, he should still get the money for his one rather than the percentage of the money yeah. for his one, a fraction of it, based on the fact that he's not selling as many records as the million seller. Because yeah, at the moment it's, it works, and it just all goes into a big pot and you're paid proportionately, yeah. where it's not quite fair. I suppose the ultimate payback is the audience reaction and the ticket sales on the door. And as long as you're doing that, that's where you can control your audience. And that's what you're best at, isn't it? You are a live yeah, that's band. True. That's true. That's true. But that's always been the way. It's just that we've had one. I sound like I'm really banging on now. But we've had one taken away from us, which is um, record sales. Yeah. You know, by and large, that's taken a big hit because of the advancement of technology. Whereas people now don't buy records because they can get them for free. They yeah. can rip them. And uh, and then that engenders a sense of people who get so used to doing that that they don't want to pay for their music anymore. Mm. And you get a mentality of uh, where people expect it to be free. And it's um, that's not sustainable. No, it's not. And people like you two releasing their albums for free on iTunes or whatever, I think that has backfired. And I think the whole thing has got a real line, hasn't it, to give everybody a chance. Yes, I t yeah, absolutely. It devalues the record. Yeah. Well, you know what they say, if it's free, it must be worthless, which um, yeah, is unfortunate. Absolutely. And then we see that you're back and you're going on tour again, which is brilliant. And there's a lot of hype around the return of the tour. What was the reason that you decided now was the right time to come back? It's, it seems like things go full circle, don't they? You go away and then you come back now. Yeah, that's it. I think it's, it's, a, it's a chemical thing, really. There was a sense amongst the four of us of a bit, you know, an, an absence in our lives, which hadn't been there in the last four years. I mean, we're quite happily ploughing on with our, you know, in, in, in new directions, as it were. But um, now I think we just missed each other. I think once it was out and in the room that a couple of us in the band were just sort of saying, how do you fancy getting back on the horse? As soon as we knew that the thought was there, it was like, well, yeah, of course, let's do it. Well, now's a great time. Why not? How has it changed since the last time you were together in a room? Are there new wives involved and children? Yes, all, all that sort of thing. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
Um, but doesn't that, that that doesn't really affect what happens once the doors close and the instruments are humming. Yeah, music's music. Yeah. And for you, is it thrilling the thought of standing back on that stage recreating these songs? I can't wait. Yeah, it really is. It's been it's been a good good enough time off now for me to really be looking forward to it as opposed to um, not dreading it, but you certainly sometimes take things for granted. Congratulations on everything, including your back catalogue. I mean, you really have created some of the greatest songs for radio. And for me, as I say, during that 90s period, the Chris Evans years and all that stuff, it was such a special time for music and it was great that you were part of it. For that, that's a wonderful legacy to take away, isn't it? That's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Yeah, we've, we've certainly been... I'm very fortunate as well, so... Thank you, Dave. May that continue for a long time. The Blue Tones UK tour continues, and uh, I'm sure you'll end up around the world as well because you've huge fans, Japan and places like that. In fact, that was the place that you, you last performed, wasn't it? Yeah, we ended it all uh, in, in Japan four years ago, yeah. Which, 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 which at the time, it was it was it felt so right that that we did it there because, we, you know, we weren't surrounded by wives and girlfriends and friends and all that sort of thing. It was just the four of us ending it quite quietly and able to sort of have a little reflective time before we all got pulled apart I'm so glad you're back the Blue Tones UK tour uh, kicks off very shortly Mark Morris great to talk to you likewise nice to talk to you too